uncharacteristically punctual this, this time. Um, there is um, probably people will be coming in and out, but uh, Sarah doesn't mind this. It's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Rosario Fazio, who is uh, now uh, the um, head of condensed matter physics um, at uh, ICTP in Trieste. I think many of you will know that place. Um, he actually did his uh, PhD in Catania, in Sicily, uh, on condensed matter systems. Um, he was one of the early um, pioneers of, of various superconducting technologies. This is during the days when, when people didn't believe that um, superconducting qubits will even make sense and exist. I think we had Nobel laureates in the late, uh, late 90s and, and early 2000s who actually still argued against quantum coherence in this system. And at that time, Sarah was already advocating this as a good technology for, for qubits. And actually, he's vindicated now. This is one of the probably uh, most promising directions that we, uh, that we have. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. I met Sarah almost 20 years ago. Um, he came to one of my talks, I think, in, um, in Palermo. And that was great because I literally, I saw them coming out of, I think it was his group members and him, coming out of his ca car. I think they drove from Catania to Palermo. And they were singing Crosstown Traffic, song by Jimi Hendrix. It's one of my favorites, actually. I love Jimi. Um, and, and I thought th this was very good vibes. You know, I can get on with these guys. Uh, this was a song where Jimmy compares his girlfriend and how unapproachable she is to cross town traffic, you know, a, a quintessentially American song, I suppose. But that was great, uh, great to see. And in fact, after that talk, Sarah approached me and he said, what you propose, we can do immediately in superconducting bits. And I said to him, what is a superconducting qubit? I had no idea at that time. So he took about half an hour to explain it to me. And that ended up being a nature paper, probably the fastest paper. So our first collaboration was a nature paper, and then we worked our way down to Fizz Rev and so on, whatever we are publishing now, I think. Um, Sarah has made many important contributions, but one thing I want to emphasize, that's the last thing I'm going to say about him to embarrass him. Um, he's um, an excellent teacher and popularizer of science as well. Um, most of you will know that this works by analogy, and I think some of the most fantastic analogies I've heard from Saro, so I just have to tell you this, uh, this story. Um, it's basically how to illustrate uh, the second law of thermodynamics, um, but now I'm going to use your typical uh, physics department, and, and the argument will be that the average intelligence and the ability of the members of staff in your typical physics department goes down with time. You know, the second law says that everything becomes more dissipative and degenerate with time, and so it goes with your average physics department. And the argument that I heard from Sarah goes like this. You set up a panel of faculty members to interview a new member of staff, and none of these panel members wants to elect someone more intelligent and more able than they are. So they end up hiring someone who is less able. And if you extrapolate this with time, the average intelligence of your physics department goes down. And then at some point, you know, it hits the rock bottom. That's called thermal equilibrium in physics. <laughs> and your panel now is so stupid that they can't even tell whether the new candidate is intelligent or not. That's how bad they are, OK? So by pure luck, they end up giving a job to someone super smart. And this is called a fluctuation away from equilibrium. It's actually Boltzmann's theory how the universe began from thermal equilibrium. It's a great illustration. So somehow you wind up the clock again and you start from a higher level and so on. I think it's a great illustration of that. Um, anyhow, I think Sarah will probably use many of these. He promised to me that he won't have a single equation tonight. It's a very uh, popular talk, and, and I'm extremely happy to have him here as I think he's basically the first visiting professor of um, Oxford Martin School, funded by, by Lillian Martin, and he's in our uh, bio-inspired quantum cluster. Great pleasure, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vladko. I'm sure I will not be, I, I will not fulfill the expectation. So I just tell uh, from the outside. 
outside. So um, I struggle a lot in trying to to fix this talk or the content of this talk because I'm pretty sure that here there are many more many physicists who are much more uh, well prepared than myself uh, in uh, presenting such a talk. So at the end, uh, I decided to just give you an idea and uh, kind of a history of uh, a part of quantum tech or nanoscience in quantum technology, which uh, is related to superconductivity, as Vladko mentioned. But before uh, going to the uh, to the heart of the talk, I really would like to uh, acknowledge Oxford Martin School, Lillian Martin, for the great opportunity. I'm really having uh, a lot of good time and uh, good collaboration. So th this is really great for me. Uh, so how to introduce uh, uh, the topic of today? Well, actually, this year is uh, an interesting uh, year for um, quantum technologies, uh, European Commission asked uh, this gentleman to write a kind of quantum manifesto. So kind of uh, an essay which uh, will illustrate the potential impact or the future impact of quantum technology in, uh, uh, in our society. And this is not just a book. This, uh, this pamphlet will be officially released uh, in May, actually in a couple of weeks, uh, in official ceremony I think in Holland. But the interesting uh, point is that the uh, European community is uh, committed to uh, invest a lot in quantum technologies. Because, uh, and actually there will be there will be a program, I think 10 years program, which will be set up in order to strengthen uh, quantum technologies in Europe. And among uh, the goals of this initiative is that it is believed, and not only scientists believe, but also nowadays uh, people in funding uh, agencies, that quantum technologies can provide uh, innovative and uh, good solution to a lot of uh, uh, present challenges in our society, in energy, uh, environment, m information, communication, many aspects which uh, may have uh, a beneficial impact from new quantum technologies. And uh, in this quantum revolution, say, nanoscience is playing an important role. So let me say that, uh, so first of all, I would like really apologize with the experts. I mean, I will disappoint them. And second, I'm not saying that nanoscience is the most important technology. I mean, there is no competition. There will be, se there are several proposals, very interesting platforms, and, quantum and na nanoscience is one of them. But so uh, why nanoscience may be important for quantum technologies? Well, actually, there are uh, several features of uh, nano devices that make them uh, interesting for uh, the quantum revolution. So first of all, uh, nano devices have a lot of flexibility. Just in a couple of slides, uh, I will show you how is it possible to design different nanostructures many, in many different configurations with uh, different uh, fun functionalities. Uh, at the same time, there is a lot of control that can be applied to those small uh, structures. We are talking about yeah, submicron of nanostructures. Um, it is expected that these small devices will have performances that uh, will be quantum enhanced. Just let me give you one out of many examples, say, beyond uh, quantum computation. So, for instance, it is 
possible to just to build up very small thermal heat machines or refrigerators which use uh, nano devices and these are important because just imagine uh, at, uh, at small scale uh, it is very important to cool uh, your device, your laptop, or it is important just to control heat transfer. And uh, it is believed that uh, heat machines or refrigerators based on quantum properties might be more efficient to deal with this. So in a sense, the functionality of your device will be enhanced by uh, kind of its quantum character. And finally, uh, integration is also important. So uh, there are several works uh, in which people experimentally implemented uh, sub, uh, interfaces between superconductors, semiconductors, insulators, uh, interfaces between optics and solid states. And finally, and probably this was one of the most important motivation at the beginning, scalability. It somehow, I mean, there is uh, the belief and the hope, and it's to a certain extent uh, true, that if you are able to build up a small device, then it's very easy to build up a million of them. So the situation is not so, uh, you know, so, so simple, but uh, there, is, there are no principal restriction of this. And uh, out of this, uh, all these nice features, let me start just giving, giving you some uh, few examples of uh, uh, how flexible uh, the design of the nanostructures can be and uh, how is it possible to control. And uh, this is, I should make this disclaimer, of course, this is just a random sampler, sample out of many, many possible examples that I uh, will not present for no good reasons, but I would say for time reasons. Uh, just in the abstract, I mentioned quantum wires. Just here, this is uh, um, an um, INAS indium arsenide quantum wire contacted by uh, several electrodes. And the idea of uh, control is already here. So you see that you have a small nanostructure, which is your wire in this case, but that you can control uh, through some macroscopic uh, uh, probes. At the end, you attach electrodes to your systems and uh, by changing gate voltage or uh, voltage drops, you can really control what happens, say electrical conduction or thermal conduction through this small, very small area. What about flexibility? Well, for instance, this is an example uh, of a single nanowire, but you can also imagine to consider, or actually not imagine, this is really an experimental picture, to realize couple nanowires. Uh, an example that I chose here is that uh, these nanowires are not uh, on a substrate, but they are suspended. So they just they are, can float in the uh, in the in vacuum and uh, can oscillate. And this is very interesting because here uh, the electrical properties can be combined in a controlled way with the mechanical properties of uh, uh, these small nanostructures. And out of uh, here, you can really uh, look for really beautiful physics, uh, synchronization, quantum synchronization. And at the same time, you can also make a sense also from an, an applied uh, point of view and trying to really build up useful, quote unquote, uh, devices out of those systems. Well, you can have a wire on the substrate, you can have uh, a suspended wire, you can also build up uh, micro pillars in which your wire is just uh, kind of vertical and can oscillate 
And uh, what is interesting is that you see here the way in which you just grow the nanowire such that you really can control the material that you are growing and eventually just uh, make interfaces or create some small uh, region uh, in which you can confine electrons, say quantum dots. So you see that these are just very few uh, examples in which uh, you have uh, a variety of uh, the same, let's say, let me say the same building block, a wire, a small wires, but in a very different configurations and uh, with very different control. And that it, then it's up to our fantasy to really make them uh, useful. So wires, I just mentioned wires, but also you can also uh, imagine uh, to confine uh, your system not in one dimension, but just in a very small region, in a dot, a quantum dot. And this is one example. I apologize. I mean, I just really cannibalize pictures from uh, the web, and in some cases I forgot to put uh, the reference. Uh, but you see that uh, here, these are small dots. These are small structures, so here these are kind of zero dimensional, so electrons are confined uh, in a tiny region, and then you can really change the shape. And this change of shape may be just a kind of pictorial uh, amusement, or can be important in defining the uh, properties of those systems. Also dots can be uh, contacted, as in the case in which uh, I mentioned before of wires. So here you see, this is one example. Uh, instead of creating this structure, just imagine, just to make your uh, contact with the previous slides, uh, so you can grow up dots out of the substrate in the same way in which you made a micro pillar, or you can just define your small region, but just um, uh, confining the electron on small, this small region, small circles here. These are, this is essentially uh, a substrate, a two-dimensional electron gas, and then you put metals on top of it, so essentially you start forbidding uh, electrons to go in certain regions, so at the end, poor electrons are forced to be either here or here. And the control, in the same way I showed you before, uh, here happens by controlling this, all these voltages here and controlling the bias voltage. Just to make, again, a comparison with the previous slides, you can also imagine to realize your dots, or in this case, better say, metallic islands, suspended. And uh, this is one example or what is called an electron shuttle. So just, you see that here, these are two big contacts, and this is just uh, a small dot, okay? So it, for this particular case, uh, the dot is made by some uh, metallic islands, but it's not really important. What is nice uh, of this device is that, and this is just one example in which you can uh, uh, realize control and is, for instance, to, to shuttle the current. So this dot is essentially oscillating like this, okay? So just like, you just imagine just a boat which goes from uh, the two shores of a river in a well-defined well way. So each time it goes on the left, it takes a person and brings it to on the right, okay? And this, this type of shuttling just takes one electron at the time and brings it to the other, uh, to the other side. And this is very uh, interesting, for example, to make, it, to make kind of current standards. So this is not optimal in the sense that uh, there are much better examples, but just, just to give you the idea uh, how to relate uh, the flexibility in design and the control into something which might be useful. Nanostructures are not uh, uh, 
made only of semiconductors of metals, there is uh, really a plethora of uh, devices which uh, use superconductivity. And the presence of superconductivity is very important to really give uh, specific, a specific flavor to those uh, systems. So, as I said at the beginning, I will spend uh, most of my time in talking to, uh, of superconductivity. This is one example of uh, a, a system uh, realized at Caltech in the group of uh, Keith Schwab. This is just a resonant cavity. And this is uh, just, uh, so you see this is very small, tiny wire, superconducting, this can oscillate. So in this case, superconductivity is very important in giving uh, enhanced coherence to the system. I will come back to coherence in a while. Just for the moment, just enjoy the nice. So unfortunately, uh, as far as I understand, I mean, as a theorist, I always thought the, exp I mean, the, the devices are like this. Actually, I found out uh, that uh, with my disappointment that these are colors which are put afterwards, which is, I mean, somewhat takes something from the uh, nicest thing, you see? So this is an, another example. This is small superconducting islands. So you see that electrons are actually pairs of electrons are really confined on a very small scale here between these two arms here. This is a very important uh, egg, uh, uh, nanostructure which uh, was realized uh, and was, is being used. I mean, it's really a standard uh, in, uh, in Zurich in the group of uh, Waldraff. One last example. So. Uh, here, electrons can really travel over a ring and just, just can make very non-trivial patterns. And these non-trivial patterns might be very important in defining the properties of uh, uh, the system. So far, I will show, I, I sh just show you pictures. So uh, let me, I, I will come back, I mean, uh, uh, to just uh, some ideas about the physics that you can do. But the last, one last point I, I just want to make is about scalability. As I said, the nice things about nanoscience is that, well, you're able to make this small loop. Well, the idea is that you will be able to make many of them, okay? So this is something uh, which makes uh, nanoscience uh, a very uh, potentially strong uh, tool uh, to uh, implement quantum protocols. Um, so, just that so far I gave you, I just showed you nice pictures, or at least I think they are nice pictures. But uh, what are the nice properties? Okay? Well, let me single out only two features which are somewhat in common, common to a large class of uh, these systems, which are important for what I'm going to tell you. So one thing is um, coherence, and the other thing is electron interaction. So when we talk about electrical conduction in this nanostructure, we have a very different situation from what we are used to know in our macroscopic world. One example, one feature, sorry, which is very important is coherence. Let me give you one important example. So just take this, is what this is called Aaron and Bohm ring, but it's just a ring, okay? It's just a wire which is, uh, which is made of a loop so current will end uh, from the left, goes around the loop, and goes out. Now, if you made this with our copper wiring, nothing special happens, okay? So we will just see uh, that current is flowing. When you make this at 
very small scale, submicron scale, then the fact that one electron enters can go either this way or this other way will make a difference if there is a, an applied flux. And it will make a difference because on this small scale, electrons will contribute to the current remembering that it has wave-like properties. So it's not just like a particles in the, when we just use our uh, macroscopic cable. And so uh, because of this uh, wave-like behavior, if you measure the resistance of this object, or you measure the current, it's a function of the magnetic field that you apply to the system, then you will see oscillations. These oscillations are uh, really the, the distinct features that electrical conduction is a coherent process. So electrical conduction is not something we are used to know of particles moving. Okay, but we have to include also the quantum properties, the wave-like properties. So coherence is something important. So this is something I really would like to, to stress. This is a something which is a, a characteristic of uh, a small structure. If you just make this ring one meter of a diameter, you will, know, you will not see the same behavior. You just see something flat. Another feature which is very important uh, for quantum technologies is electron-electron interaction. So essentially our picture of uh, electrical conduction in wires, it's just a fluid, okay? So it's just like water. So simply that this fluid is charged. But we don't care about the fact that electrons repel, repel with the Coulomb interaction. We don't care at all. Now, if you confine electrons on such a small scale, these electrons will repel. So it really makes a difference if there is one electron here, or there are two electrons. Uh, as a result of this, the current will uh, very strongly depend on how many electrons you can uh, just squeeze in this small region. So this is a plot of, so this is a color plot of the current. It's a function of all this gate voltage. It is not really important to enter into the details. So when you see dark blue, there is no current passing through here. When there is uh, this color, then it means that current can pass. And then you see that current can be controlled at the level of single electrons. So essentially, by changing the parameters uh, just uh, by a tiny bit, then you can have situation in which there is no current. The current is blocked. And there are situations here in which current is flowing. Okay? And this is a control of the current at a single electron level. And this is very important. Now, if you put those two features together, then uh, uh, it is a way in which several uh, nanostructures, which were important for quantum info information processing, were uh, realized. Okay. Now, uh, at this point, my presentation can diverge uh, because, I mean, there are so many examples which are uh, interesting uh, that I had to make a choice, and this is just a personal choice. I decide to confine myself to superconducting nanostructures and tell you a little bit about the history of uh, why people arrive and discussing superconducting nanostructure. This is my personal point of view. Uh, 
uh, for quantum information processing. So the story of this started, starts just after the discovery of superconductivity. Uh, so the basic element of this story is called Josephson Junction. The Josephson Junction is just, there are just two pieces of superconductors separated by some insulator. Amazingly enough, and I will not attempt to explain why, the dynamics or the properties of this complex object, in many respects, can be understood by just studying the dynamics of a physical pendulum. So you have to translate, so this is not, we are talking about position, here yeah, you have to talk, take another variables, but essentially, amazingly enough, a, a just a damped pendula, pendulum will behave as such, a, such an object. And actually, Anderson, Nobel Prize winner, already in 63, understood the following. Well, if this is the case, then I can just make uh, a Josephson junction with some choice of parameters such that it will behave like a quantum pendulum. This is amazing because this is a, a big object. So we are not talking, I mean, people always tend to think that um, quantum dynamics is for atoms and molecules. When you have big objects, uh, quant a classical dynamics is, uh, uh, is appropriate. And of course, there were people that realized that it would be very interesting to understand this quantum to classical crossover. As far as I know, Anderson was the first to make a, a first concrete proposal where to look for microscop macroscopic quantum dynamics. So you just take a big thing, just a piece of, so for instance, piece of tin, two pieces of tin, you just put oxide or two pieces of aluminum, you just put the aluminum oxide in between, and this thing that you can always, so which is far away from being an atom, might obey uh, the law of quantum dynamics. But actually in 63, the technology was far behind, so it was not possible to explore those, these ideas of Anderson. Anderson published this, uh, these ideas in very obscure set of lectures given in a school, uh, physics school close to Naples. And actually the paper was essentially ignored to a large extent, because I, I, at that time it was really impossible to think, uh, to explore such a thing. Well, actually, this idea of macroscopic quantum dynamics was revived by Leggett, another Nobel Prize winner in the 80s. He started thinking uh, to, the, to, the, to the question again, actually deeply about the implication of macroscopic um, quantum dynamics and the possibility to observe this in superconductivity. So you see that already in the 80s, people were uh, Akin to look at Josephson Junction as possible example in which you can have quantum coherent dynamics. But the first step was a bit simpler. So instead of looking at a true quantum dynamics, uh, Leggett proposed, uh, together with Caldera, to look at macroscopic quantum tunneling. So essentially, tunneling, you can uh, just imagine that you have a hill here and you are here on the bottom. So classically, you have to roll, go up on the hill and then roll down. Quantum mechanically, somehow you can go through the hill. You can just pass in a kind of energetically forbidden tunnel. Okay? This is well-known effect in, uh, in uh, quantum uh, physics, but was, not, was never observed in a macroscopic system. Well, actually, Leggett proposed to uh, to observe this in a, 
in a Josephson junction and an experiment, sorry for the quality, by Martinis, Devore and Clark uh, in the middle of 80s, really observed this. So essentially, I will not discuss about the experiment, something interesting I can uh, tell more. But essentially, you see that classically, you should observe that this point should just trade on the line, which goes to zero as a function of temperature. You see this bending to a te temperature independent. And this was a clear signature of microscopic dynamics or microscopic quantum tunneling. Actually, people were not really satisfied. Tunneling is nice, but it would be much greater to really see op interference, okay, like in waves. And this was a disaster for many PhD students because at that time, uh, several people tried. So actually, there was a very interesting, uh, I, I just discovered in preparing this talk, there was a, a physicist uh, working at uh, IBM, Claudia Tesche, who really put enormous effort in realizing such an experiment, Josephson Junction. Uh, but it was very difficult. And then I, I, mean, I just lost track of, of her and found out recently that she moved to a, a biolog biology department. So I don't know if it was because of the frustration of uh, this experiment, but it really completely changed a uh, topic. Um, so people were kind of uh, fed up a little bit with this inability uh, to see qu microscopic quantum coherence. So in the 90s, they started to do something else. Well, they thought, well, instead of looking at the dynamics, we can do something which now we call quantum simulator. At that time, it was not clear at all what a quantum simulator is. But essentially, they start realizing arrays of Josephson junction. So this is uh, each line here is this junction I mentioned before, and then you just realize in a, in a regular lattice. Believe it or not, such a thing, such a complicated thing, will behave like a magnet. So people thought, OK, instead of studying a magnet, which I'm not even sure what is the Hamiltonian, what is the properties, the band, what to include or what not to include. I really take, I just build up by system. I know what I'm putting in, and I will study Curie transition to a ferromagnet in such a system. Nowadays, in a much more refined way, this is what we would call a quantum simulators. And so optical lattices, are the best uh, example of uh, uh, this quantum simulator. At the time, there was kind of very limited uh, vision uh, of that. But still, this microscopic quantum coherence was out there. And uh, I would say that quantum computation somewhat gave the right motivation. So once uh, people realized that you could do fantastic thing with quantum information processing. Essentially, several the best labs in the world started again working. And in 2000, or around 2000, there were experiments. The first one, uh, which was striking experiment done at NEC Tsukuba by Nakamura. Essentially, he did an experiment. He was a young guy. He did it because all the big uh, guys did not believe that it could work. So they did not try. He was, you know, mad enough uh, and with no permanent position, I would just say. So he was really mad. Uh, just tried experiments and, and saw these oscillations. These, uh, these oscillations uh, just tells you that this big object behaves quantum mechanically. So this is the experiment, and this is what, if you take just a, a big, uh, just an atom with two levels and do the same protocols, uh, this is what quantum mechanics will uh, uh, predict. This is not a, a, an atom. This is a big object, but it's the most complicated way to realize an atom. 
And the, you see that the agreement just by eye looks uh, amazing. You know, once Nakamura did experiments, then several people uh, start to realizing many different superconducting structures. And nowadays, you see oscillation everywhere. So now, nobody even care in just publishing this result. So this was, I think, the second experiment on a different setup. And then essentially, this oscillation, again, this uh, quantum coherence um, uh, tells you that this uh, nano device behaves quantum coherent. Uh, I, I should tell you that, uh, of course, you can do the same experiments with dots, with other nanostructure. I will not just mention because of uh, uh, lack of time. So in the remaining, say, 10 minutes or so, I, I will just tell you that actually, uh, while uh, quantum coherence is important for implementing quantum gates, this, uh, uh, this standard, uh, quote unquote, standard ideas of doing uh, um, computation through single qubits, two qubit gates, actually uh, people are exploring other possibilities, theoretically, I mean, uh, and at the same time, they are very interesting experiments. Let me mention two possible other situations. One is topological quantum computation, pioneers are Kitaev, Preskill, Friedman. So essentially, Topological quantum computation is, tells you that there are ways in which you can realize your gates, but in a kind of way which is fault tolerant. So even if you make a mistake, the physical system will uh, be insensitive to your mistake. So in the example I gave you of the Nakamura experiment, if by chance you would just switch on the a voltage for a bit, long, lo, a bit, bit longer time, then the oscillation would vary. With topological quantum computation, even, even if you make such a mistake, nothing will happen. So the system will do what it's supposed to do. But this goes at the expenses of uh, realizing a quantum computer with uh, more complex uh, objects. One of those objects are the so-called Majorana fermions. So essentially these are particles. So these are not fermions, they're not like electrons. So these are particles which were uh, hypothesized, hypo, hypo, okay, thought by Majorana soon after the paper by, by Dirac. He just thought there could be other type of Fabians, or other type of particles, uh, just by looking at Dirac equation and finding different solution. Okay, so he just said, look, if I believe in Dirac's equation, then I can find this other type of particles that were named after him. These particles were never found, so people were looking for neutrinos. Interestingly enough, as a particle, they do not exist. But they were thought to exist in a very strange nanostructure. Uh, so if you just take a wire, the wire I show you at the beginning, and you just put on top of a superconductor, and you apply a magnetic field, by magic, you can show that, uh, so this is the, the same picture, but it was downloaded from science. This is the paper which was published, which is much nicer than, than this. Uh, by magic, you will find out that this particle, this excitation, will appear at the, the two ends of the two wires. These are very strange delocalized particles. Okay, these are not like Dirac fermions. They, are, they have very different properties, but amazing people, by just realizing this structure, were able to uh, find those Majorana fermions. Okay. So this is, not, uh, this is very important. So it's not, does not clear uh, the fact that ma if Majorana fermions exist as particles, they will exist as 
kind of excitation of very complex system. But for what I'm going to tell you today, it is very interesting that they exist in a superconductor, semiconductor nanostructures because this means that, and actually that there are already some experiments that are just combining several wires, I can implement topological quantum computation. My last example is another way of doing adiabatic quantum computation. And again, also here, superconducting nanostructures um, are playing a role. So let me explain very briefly what is adiabatic quantum computation, uh, just by starting something that we all know, that is annealing. Okay, so annealing is a process in which you just take a material, you just uh, heat it, and then just gently cools down. By this gentle cooling down, the defects essentially disappear. This is one example of, uh, I forgot which materials. You just take these materials, which looks like blue, you just make the, this annealing process and it becomes transparent. Okay, so for some reason, this idea works very well for computation. So now, just imagine, so essentially annealing is the following process. Just take some particles, okay? And these particles have some temperature. So we just, uh, just uh, scatter around. But then you start lowering the temperature, okay? So by lowering the temperature, you see that uh, they, uh, they will, so I, I think at my time it's called like pinball, wizard, pinball right? So they, they will start just going, rolling down, no? And so eventually they will go in the minima of this potential. Now, the more gentle you do this cooling, uh, the higher probability you have that they go into the minima, right? Because if you just cool very fast, then you can get trapped here. You see, then you just uh, cool, cool, and then you just end up in the right minima. Just imagine that essentially you can imagine to solve a problem by rephrasing as a way to find the minima of very complex potential landscape. Now, you can do it just by thermal annealing, as you do it with uh, the, in this example, or you just doing, you can do it at the quantum level. You just change some parameters, and the system will adjust to the local minima. So you just do it by quantum tunneling and not by class, by thermal uh, annealing. This is what has been conceived uh, and is related to uh, adiabatic quantum computation. But the only thing, the, the, the thing I want to say is that a protocol for adiabatic quantum computation was realized by using superconducti superconducting circuits by a company called D-Wave. This is the chip. Uh, so it is built up on a very, very complex graph, uh, which is called chimera, uh, chimera graph. And essentially, the wave just build up what they call a quantum computer. And this is a very strange story. So at the beginning, the scientific community was very skeptical. So they th actually, they thought it was, they were completely crazy. So for several years, there was no really discussion. But the, eventually, over the years, I think the scientific community and the D-Way approach trying to uh, get closer. So what happened was that, for instance, D-Wave uh, sold uh, two of these computers uh, to n uh, NASA in, and to Google. So people start doing experiments. And now the situation is not clear if this is a true quantum computer. But you know, that once I, go, I went to the, this lab and I just took a picture with this. So it looks like a gigantic PlayStation. So my, my son would be really proud of myself. So I don't know if this is a quantum computer, but it looks cool, I would say. 
And uh, with this, I would like to, to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Um, after which we have some drinks. So um, I'll open the floor to questions. Please. So one of the problems that everybody had doing the quantum computer in general, and the quantum computation in general, is incoherence. So um, it appears whenever you see a system which has two units, um, when they're isolated, they behave beautifully. getting um, just the balance right between enough interaction to allow you to actually perform a quantum operation, but not too much interaction and getting things to actually decohere too quickly. Okay, so, well, this is the question, so you don't expect that I'm going to answer, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, uh, let, let, let me say that there were a lot of progresses done in the last year. I think this is the, the I, I would say, the most concrete answer I can give you. So it's not that, so at the beginning, you should, I mean, you know very well that in the 90s, people really thought that people like Landauer thought that this idea of quantum computation in the presence of decoherence was completely crazy. So very simple, uh, so we, with ion traps, I mean, not nanoscience, but with ion traps, people realize entangled state with um, tens of particles. They realize simple algorithms. So, so I, the, there is space. And the, of course, the, the holy grail would be either to realize this topological stuff or to realize these fault tolerant uh, architectures. But there, I think we are a bit far in the sense that gates are not uh, accurate enough to, to, to be below this threshold. So. Is there one more? Just to put the mic here. Yeah. In, in the first half of your lecture, you showed us a lot of micro, micron-sized structures. And I got from that that the quantum world really was sub-micron, probably tens of nanometers, that sort of distance. And then you put up Anderson's work with the Johnson cell. When it, which, which was the macro um, world. So my question is, is it the surfaces that are actually in contact between the conducting and the insulating material where the quantum world still exists, or is it a bulk property in that, in that uh, Johnson? Okay, yes. So uh, the, the, the major achievement of Anderson, he understood that by having uh, a very small uh, contact area between the two superconductors, as you said, some micron, then the capacitance of this junction would be so large that quantum effects would set in. The problem was, uh, which is related to the previous question, at that time, the quality of these junctions were poor enough, so the coherence would kill everything. Uh, technologically, the situation changed when people started using uh, aluminum, aluminum oxide. So these are, these have resistance of order of several kilo ohms. And this would, this may, made the situation much better. I, I would say that, I would just add that there is something psychological, I, I don't know. So at some point, for many years, nobody saw anything. After Nakamura, everybody will see oscillation everywhere. So I don't know. This is to me is still a mystery. How is it possible? So I don't know. It's, it's so, it's so the, the resistance should be very high of this. And, um, and the capacitance, and there should be some micron. So the, essentially, if you think just as a small capacitor in practice, this should be femto, at least femto farad capacitor to see something. I think following on from the last points, the real problem here in realizing a 
of quantum computer with solid state devices is to make sure your quantum wires or quantum dots are absolutely identical. This is a, Even yes. if you do that, you have a problem of the contact of the quantum wire or quantum dot with yeah. bulk material because you'll have a band edge discontinuity there which will behave like an unknown shocky barrier. So your problems multiply as you try to realize it. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is true and this is why, why I said uh, ideally scalable, but in practice, so for instance, I show you those just as an erase which are, I don't know, they could realize thousands of... Uh, now, thousands of junctions are typically 10% different one from each other. This 10% at that time for what they want to study was irrelevant. Now, two atoms are identical in the sense they are really identical. Two junctions are never identical. So this poses a problem of calibration. Because the, the um, kind of, the brutal way would just be just to make 10 of these qubits and calibrate each of them, but this becomes not really practical. There are ideas, for instance, uh, uh, a possibility would be also just to have small quantum computer with few qubits. Probably in, for many things, you really don't need thousands of qubits. So, so as far as I know, there is no true solution to that. Could we suggest that instead of using uh, semiconductor material or superconductor material, we think of molecules because you can make molecules identical. And if we can then yes. put those molecules onto an appropriate surface in an array, you, you stand a chance because so you have got identical... Vladko elements. should answer to this question. I will not say anything. Oh, three, uh, yeah, okay. So this should answer. So it's a bit As you come to mention this fact, he says, <laughs> so we've just got, got some uh, a grant together with um, the National University of Singapore and the Center of Quantum Technologies there to try doing this with some um, uh, ten terrain molecules um, for exactly that reason. Um, that apart from some local um, changes in the energy of the molecule because of the environment it's in, um, which can be controlled, um, they are truly identical. And you know precisely what energy to use to actually excite them. You, can, you know the wavelength of your laser before you even start. So there are lots of advantages if you can engineer the, um, the molecules themselves and show that they're identical. So we're, we're trying to do something with these in the next year or two, so we'll see. This new comp computation scheme using quantum system, how do you know that you are getting, if, for example, you get this, take this system and calculate something and get a result? How do you know that you're getting the right result, something? Yeah, so there are two answers to that. So first of all, people, so I forgot, I think it's uh, Seth Lloyd, uh, Aronoff, Dorit Aronoff, they show that for, at the theoretical level, doing computation in this way is equivalent to doing gates. Okay, so theoretically this is uh, uh, an established fact. There is another issue which I think is related to your question which is very interesting and I'm not sure uh, I still address. It's about how, how can I certify that actually my computer is doing what I'm supposed so what is supposed to, or he or she is, or it should, supposed to do. And I, I think that certification for quantum computational process is not uh, yet uh, a, a solved problem. So. Maybe I'm gonna abuse my, my position of power just for the last question, if you don't mind. So um, I think you, you said a couple of times that the choice of your systems and computations was personal. So you, yeah. you went superconductors and then topological and then adiabatic. Um, I think many people would like the choice because it seems that 
when you make a little bit of effort, the rest of it is given to you for free by nature. And that's what we find fascinating. So you cool the system down, and if it's the right system, suddenly it's quantum mechanical. And then if it's the right system, suddenly it's fault tolerant. Um, and, and it seems like we can get a lot by, by putting in a little bit of effort. In this case, just cooling. The same for adiabatic. You know, you cool the system down, it gives you the solution for free. Now, do you think, I'm asking you to speculate, I guess, do you think we can get rid of even of the cooling down and have some kind of room temperature? You know, that, that's still a, a major effort that we have to invest. Is there a chance of having a room temperature qubit and, and basically it's stable and we don't have to do anything, you know, in, in, in the sense what we have with classical computation? Okay, so I can go wild. You can go wild now. <laughs> Uh, so, of course, that would be super cool, in the sense that the room temperature would yeah. be super cool. But, uh, uh, so I think there, you really probably, I would just look for something dynamical. So, statically, it's very hard. Either you just uh, devise something on, with energy scales, which, I don't know, a gap, which is huge as compared to temperature, but I cannot imagine that this might be the case, or you have kind of dynamical protections, which, uh, uh, so in, in a sense, I, I don't know, but NMR somehow was something which worked in an almost uh, incoherent uh, thing. So, so it was almost identity and still uh, people could uh, realize quantum information. So I would say, yeah. Not impossible. Not impossible. But luckily, I'm a theorist. You're a theorist, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have to work that hard. Okay, uh, shall we thank uh, Sarah for this fascinating talk once again? Thank you very much. And I think you're very welcome to interact with him less formally over, over drinks there, so.